the uh, day I came back to the U.S. after being in Thailand was, or this most recent um, time several years ago, was on election day of 2020. So a fortuitous landing. And when I was preparing to come back, one of the teachers who I spoke to, Ajahn Siri Panyo, said, look, when you return, you can look at the news every now and again, but only if you can make the determination not to let it give rise to even one unwholesome mind state. It's a tall order, right? <laughs> so, and I said, okay. And he said, look, remember, America is just one big convention. It's a convention. And I can't say I've completely managed that, but this uh, return to an America uh, I found changed where people were still living lives that were, by and large, as beautiful as they had been when I'd left seven years earlier. They were surrounded by loving people and doing beautiful things, and yet they, their hearts were ragged with talk of the news and the headlines, and I saw people forgetting the Eden that their hands worked in for the faint distant whisper of a serpent. And the Buddha has a term called appropriate attention, yoni so manasikara. Yoni means womb, and manasikara is attention, uh, action of the chitta, of the mind. And this idea of attention that goes to the heart, the womb, the source of things, and that attention is, in a very real sense, what births all states of our mind and heart is a central teaching. The Buddha says that even as dawn, the band of light on the horizon signals the coming of the sun, so yoni so manasikara, appropriate attention, pre, uh, precedes the arising of the Noble Eightfold Path. So this idea of the importance of attention it's a sankara, which in Buddhist terminology means it's a, a program, um, a formation which energizes what it looks at. And appropriate attention is especially significant because in, I think it's the words of Kierkegaard, evil lies in the gaze that sees evil all around it. So I hate to tell y'all, but uh, the last three years haven't helped too much in terms of that political thing. Uh, so this term, the culture wars, that's a new one. I haven't, uh, ha didn't hear before I left or came. And I remember my dad speaking, he's a practitioner, uh, visiting some relatives uh, a few, a year ago. It's Easter, so I think many of you will have the wonderful opportunity to practice Dhamma around the dinner table. There's a uh, famous saying in Buddhism that if you think you're enlightened, go spend a week with your family. <laughs> so... Good luck, all of you. And uh, the conversation turned to politics. And um, my dad got up, and he went over to where the dog was lying on the ground, and he lay down with the dog. So how do we become conscientious objectors in the culture wars? And it's a, a bit of anathema to the uh, American psyche. What it means to have a part of society that's not political. And yet it's the, one of the key functions of the Sangha in Thailand is some realm where people can enter the monastery and they're not this or that, uh, they're just Buddhist. They're just practitioners. They don't even have to be Buddhist. They're just people come looking for refuge. And this is important for several reasons. If the Sangha aligns with a certain political party and the opposite party comes into power, it can wipe out the Sangha. That happens. It also alienates half of society if you get one alignment. And Democrats deserve Dhamma. Republicans deserve Dhamma. Everyone deserves Dhamma. And um, 
So it's important to have a part of society that where that connection can occur. And ironically, that's actually how a lot of these things resolve themselves is by having some space where people can come together and be human together, and that's it. We have an institution in the US like this. It's called Dolly Parton. <laughs> and it's one of the few places in the US where truckers and drag queens come together and they can stand by each other. And that's wonderful. And I've heard her referred to as the Dolly Mama. And <laughs> her political leanings are a carefully guarded secret. And thank goodness for that. It's pretty beautiful to have something in the US like that. But in some sense, Dolly Parton stole the role of the Sangha in the US. So, what's important to acknowledge is, uh, you know, two very large caveats. Um, there is a role for political discussion, for talking to people about what is meaningful. There is a role for political action and taking action. But when one is determining when and how to do that, it's very important to understand that as practitioners of this path, you have stepped into a higher order narrative and a higher order purpose and you're in possession of something which is far more important than the political debate of the day. This uh, Dhamma, which was given to us 2,500 years ago, this psychology is profound and it has, uh, I know it's saved my life in a sense. I know many who's, it's in a sense given them meaning and so few people uh, have this or have access to it that once you've come into contact with it, it's very important to understand that if an interaction with someone comes down to engaging in the usual narrative or debate versus maybe thinking that you can, for a time, put that aside and assume that many of these people have, are hearing the opposite argument from many places already, but that you might be the one conduit in that person's life to something they really need, practice, a refuge, right view, a spiritual path, and a canopy of meaning, which in our society has been left in tatters. And then you can weigh uh, very carefully what conversations to have and what actions to take and if it's right to go lie down with the dog you go lie down with the dog and wait until the conversation turns towards something else and I find one really useful way of understanding this higher order narrative and in fe and feeling its power and gravity is to recollect the beings in the past who have carried on this teaching for us so you know I uh, to think of the Dalai Lama and what that means for someone to touch him uh, in terms of coming to contact, how that can change a life, um, to think in terms of beings. Uh, one of the Dalai Lama's disciples uh, in, I think, the 1970s was put into Chinese prison and tortured for 18 years. And when he emerged, they asked him, w did you ever become afraid in prison? And he said, I became afraid sometimes that I would lose compassion for my captors, but he didn't. There's the monks and nuns uh, in China during the Maoist revolution who, when beaten uh, and uh, tried to, when the Maoist guard tried to get them to disrobe, they simply said uh, the name of their bodhisattva again and again and remained. And this is why this teaching um, this institution of the Sangha, which is humanity's oldest institution, except for the Jains, they beat us by like a few years. We always have to add that caveat. Um, it's outlasted the rise and fall of empires. And I don't know if we really understand the impact it's had over history to have this thin silver thread of these teachings. And I don't think we can underestimate the impact that that flash that supernova of insight that the Buddha gave us has had. There's very good emerging archeological evidence that the monastic form in Christian traditions came from Buddhist monks who came to the Mediterranean. Um, there's a famous uh, church in Italy uh, dedicated to St. Josaphat, 
And only later did they find that all of St. Yosafat's exploits were actually the exploits of the Bodhisattva. Uh, Yosafat was the uh, way they spelled Bodhisatt, Bodhisattva. And the Buddhist tradition had rippled out into even there. Um, similarly, the whole psychological tradition in the U.S., which was founded by William James in 1880 in Harvard, uh, right uh, when he was founding that, he met uh, or went to the uh, World Parliament of Religions in 1893, where he met uh, Anagarika Dhammapada, or Dhammapala. And this whole concept of separating out yourself out from your thoughts, observing stream of consciousness, um, was deeply, deeply influenced American psychology and uh, psychology after that. One of his students, students was Gertrude Stein, who went to Paris and was instrumental in educating the left bank Paris artists, including Picasso, Hemingway, James Joyce. This ripple of this insight has spread throughout our history. And so then we come and we land in a world with smartphones and uh, updates and Apple News and some vague nebulous conception of quote-unquote staying informed. And it's very important for us to look as practitioners at that term. What does it mean to stay informed? How many times a day do we really have to check the news to stay informed? And Ajahn Sona says, look, you can totally continue to watch the local news. And by local news, I mean what's six feet away from you. I think that can be a little extreme. I, think, I don't think we have to take it that far necessarily, although you could. But understanding that as practitioners, you have a responsibility to embody this path and carry it forward with integrity. And you represent it, and you might be the one person to represent it to someone in their life when they need it most. So when we begin to practice, often it's as if you're scraping off a crust that's formed on the heart. And there's a real period of rawness where the wound can become infected again and you feel it when you, old stimulus you used to have no problem taking and suddenly you feel its residue, its stickiness, its infection. And it's okay to give yourself permission for a time to step back from it to protect this precious thing you've created or created space for to cultivate the heart and to consider that a real duty and your foremost duty. So this means unsubscribing from the news in a lot of cases. If you need to read a long form article or two every week, that's fine. Honestly, if you have a few friends who are up to date, if you really stop watching the news, you'll find you get everything you need from those conversations, truly, it's, it's enough. And then if you need to do a bit more research before you vote, great but to protect your heart and to understand this anger uh, that so you can feel it. And it's not, uh, we have a responsibility to ourselves, to the practice and to those around us to point to and embody and communicate a higher order narrative now because you've stumbled across it and so few people in the world have it. So there's a few really useful tools in this toolkit. One is uh, in the Vinaya, the monastic code, we have to, as monks, meet several conditions before we can admonish another monk. Um, we have to have a mind of loving kindness. That's a big one. I know a monk who's had to wait a whole year before that could be accomplished. We have to uh, speak at a time, uh, in a timely, timely way. So at monasteries, we eat once a day. You don't talk to monks before the meal. You have to speak truthfully. Uh, speak what is connected with the matter at hand. That's huge. And ask for permission and receive permission. All five of those conditions have to be met. And you find that if before going into any you know, admonishing your parents who you just wish would, you know, get with it, or your child or the 
blank uncle, whatever it is, to see if those conditions can be met and to be very careful when you engage in that. And it's this very beautiful wall because if there's even a sliver of anger in the statement, in the conversation, it changes everything and they sense it. In a sense, often right speech can be embodied in listening. So often listening is right speech and people are kind of confused by it when you listen and are actually curious about where they're coming from and they're touched. It's very easy to find nice people. It's very hard to find curious people. And often that's the key in a relationship. Like I very much notice when someone's actually interested in you and that's such a pure form of loving kindness and people want so deeply to be seen. And in some sense, the volume with which they express a view is just them wanting to be seen. So the Four Noble Truths are a foundational framework for Buddhist thought to comprehend suffering, to let go of its cause, craving, to realize peace, to develop the path to that peace. And it all starts often with the initiating wound, the first noble truth. So much of our action comes from our pain. It drives often our whole lives. Jung said, that which is unacknowledged becomes your destiny. So this is useful in our own experience. If you lash out, can you see what vulnerability you're protecting against, um, et cetera. But also using the, found, the framework of the Four Noble Truths to understand how someone's coming to a view, because so often it's based on suffering. Um, if there's a certain push for a uh, powerful movement of some kind in the political arena, is it coming from communities uh, which have been ripped apart by fentanyl and want some means or sense of control? And is that understandable? Can you see where that's coming from? Can you trace it back to the shared wound of humanity? And can you do that in conversation? And just for a time, take that space of listening and kindness and see where that goes. Um, often, you know, I would have to, uh, I, as an early monk, uh, a young monk would go visit my Idahoan relatives and they were very confused with what I was doing. Um, and, you know, some of, there's a whole variety, a spectrum of political views there and I just found where we connected was the fact that they had deep, deep faith in, uh, in God. They were profoundly earnest Christians. And I, that's what I cared about talking about. And in a sense, the fact that so many realms of conversation right now are fraught is a strange blessing because it means you are forced to focus on what actually matters because everything else will get you in an argument. So that's a gift. Can you for focus on what matters? And this is also to say with the people near to you who might be expressing support or there's a certain type of compassion with a shadow where you'll hear someone lament something that came up in the news and you know the next sentence is gonna be and those people. And can you begin to detect that? And is there a place for gently not feeding that, just can you point to compassion? Can you point to where those people might be coming from? Can you find, again, this thread back to the shared wound and transcendent narrative which we, which we have? And this really feeds finally into the broader aspect in Buddhist practice of controlling anger and softening into loving kindness. Because one of the reasons that these political powers and narratives and debates have such uh, grip is because we are very prone to anger. And it's a part of us that we don't acknowledge that much. We love to come into a meditation and spread metta, and that's great. But when the Buddha spoke, spoke about right intention, the second factor of the path, uh, he spoke about the intention towards renunciation, the intention towards non-ill will, abhayapara, uh, and the intention toward non-harming, awihingsa. So two of those are about giving up aversion because we can really dwell in a low-grade hum of aversion for most of our lives. It's there a lot. 
and to uh, acknowledge that one of the chief functions of mindfulness in life is first to protect your morality, to keep on the path, but second, and very much second, is to avoid dwelling in ill will. Those two standards for right mindfulness are not bad ones to keep. So can we work on a whole to soften anger and to work with it? It's really, it's very prominent, and you'll usually have to bring out a wide tool belt of of tools to actually address it because it'll shape shift and one method will work for a while and then stop. So the Buddha gave us a lot of methods. Uh, Ajahn Sona says, if you can't spread loving kindness to someone, spread it to their chair. That's good. Uh, another great one is the Buddha said, if you feel aversion towards someone, try to spread loving kindness to them. Try, if that doesn't work, try and spread compassion, karuna. If that doesn't work, try to be equanimous to them. Notice that he skips the sympathetic joy. I think he knows that's a tall order to feel sympathetic joy towards someone we're having trouble with. If that doesn't work, reflect that they are subject to their karma. And if that doesn't work, don't bring them to mind. And that's a novel one in the US because we think, you know, okay, we've got to confront this and figure it out. Sometimes it's okay to write their name on an envelope or on a piece of paper, put it in an envelope put it in a drawer and say, in six months, I'll take this out. And if I'm ready to maintain a skillful, uh, balanced mind state when I think of this person, then great. And if you take it out and it's still as raw as it ever was, it may be all right to put aside for a time. So it's okay. And that goes with politics. If you stop steering your attention to there every single day, the heart brightens naturally. So if there's that politician whose name you don't like, put it, write it on a piece of paper and put it in. Um, and, you know, the next is, there's a beautiful sutta where the Buddha says you should approach someone who is pure in speech, but impure in body, in bodily action as someone would encountering a soiled piece of cloth on the road where they would use one foot to rip off the clean part of the cloth and pick that piece up. Even so, you look towards the good qualities of that person. You should look towards someone with pure bodily action but impure speech as you would a man uh, dying of thirst would bend down to a pond covered in algae and gently sweeping the algae out of the way would drink. Even so, you look to the good. You should look to someone impure in body, impure in speech, but with occasional moments of clarity as a man starving of thirst or dying of thirst would if he came to a hoof print filled with muddy water and gently bending his face down so as not to disturb the silt at all would drink carefully from that water, even so you look to the good. You should look to someone pure in speech, pure in body, and with clarity of mindfulness as a man dying of thirst would, oh, wi with clarity of mindfulness, so pure in all respects, would look to a cool oasis. And you should look to someone impure in body, impure in speech, without occasional moments of clarity, as you would look at a sick person starving, stumbling across the desert with compassion. That's our standard as practitioners. And uh, someone was listening, there was a radio program where they had different spiritual leaders speak from different traditions about the seven deadly sins, I believe. And every tradition except Buddhism said there was a place for anger. In Buddhism, there is never a place to express anger. It's never skillful. The Buddha said, even if you were being sawed limb by limb from bandits, one who gave rise to a thought of will would not be doing my bidding. So that's a standard. And it's very important to put the caveat here. Some people have never learned to express anger or to assert themselves or to set boundaries. And obviously, you need to do that. There's also a very clear distinction between repression and suppression. Repression is saying, I'm not angry, I'm not angry, I'm not angry. Suppression is saying, okay, here's anger, I'm not going to act from this. And then you wait an hour or two, you go for a walk, and then you speak from a place of kindness. 
You take it as a signal, but it's never skillful to express. And one of the most powerful tools in uh, cultivating loving kindness and dispelling anger, and sometimes sort of that uh, bright, fluffy metta is just not available. And often the best you can do is acknowledge that the metta needs to be for yourself when you're angry. Instead of trying to spread it to the person you're angry with, just feel how much it hurts to be angry, how, how painful it is. And spread the loving kindness there. Uh, if you get caught up, up in self-righteous anger, just feel the draw of it so you understand. The Buddha said to let go of something, you need to understand the attraction, the drawback, and the escape. And there's a real attraction to self-righteous anger. The Buddha called anger with its honeyed tip and poisoned root. And one of the most powerful tools I find is to look at these uh, people in our lives um, who, who do trigger us, who don't have the same views as us, as teachers. Uh, in the Mahayana conception, there's this idea that bodhisattvas can split off a piece of their mind and send it down as an incarnation of a situation, of your boss, of a drunk in the street to teach you. And if you really turn towards those people in your life who are most difficult, not as obstacles p to your path, but as exactly what you need to learn to develop loving kindness, patience, then that's something that Take them as your teacher. And if you need to bow in their direction every morning, then do that. Maybe not when they're there, but it's useful. Um, I remember one monk who I was having a lot of trouble with, and he was getting on my case for a lot of things. And I realized that if a senior teacher was giving this much attention to me and my refining my conduct, I would be so grateful and so for that year, he was my teacher, and it was uh, one of the most powerful practices of my life. And the magic of this is that if we do this, if we turn towards the higher order narrative, if when someone's getting into this discussion, if you just aim to find the first noble truth for them, what is meaningful to them, what's difficult for them, where are they coming from, just ask questions, see if we can pull back on the, on the expressing our opinions and assume that they're hearing enough and maybe we have something different to hear from them and to listen to and to say that might be much more important as Buddhists, as practitioners, as whatever you want to call yourself. There's a higher order narrative which you have in your hands now and when you come to these gatherings, it's in a gym, but you're stepping into a tradition that's 2,500 years old and do not underestimate the gravity of that commitment and responsibility and duty we have. It's not just a gift, it's a duty. And in a sense, a lot of the culture wars, a lot of the back and forth is because the canopies of meaning of our society have gone, have been ripped to shreds. And when people have no spiritual framework, they're forced to to project that on to things that are not worthy of it. And ideologies are crippled religions. They limp along, they provide cohesion and purpose, but shallow. And ironically, if you can not engage in that narrative, but really maybe give some, someone a deeper narrative, you're addressing the root cause of this imbalance. If people get a spiritual path, they are inoculated against the worst excesses of our culture. And that's what you give and you give uh, a chance of connection, of resolution, um, and you're embodying the true promise of this path and uh, also following the example of Dolly Parton. So, good luck. <laughs> Who here has actually been to a Dolly Parton concert? Is anyone? Oh, dang. It's a zero. <laughs> I haven't either. Um, okay, so um, let's try uh, breakout groups. If you're in Zoom, don't run away. 
Um, so we'll, uh, if people can just sort of circle with the three or four people nearest to them and discuss where in your life are you, do you see these trigger points of anger and how do you feel like you can actually work to address them concretely and soften that part of your heart, either relationship or, you know, trigger points in general. Um, and if you're on Zoom, we'll put you on breakout groups. And if you're on YouTube, you can join us on Zoom. Okay, uh, we'll go for 10 minutes. Please go. Hopefully you all found something to talk about with anger. Um, it's fairly. So uh, we have a chance now just to uh, speak together. So if people have something they'd like to uh, bring up from the conversation or a question you'd like to ask, then just raise your hand. We'll have a mindful mic runner come over to you and just say your name and whatever you'd like to say. And if you're on Zoom, you can raise your electronic hand and we'll try to call on you. And uh, if you're on YouTube or Zoom, you can also chat type in your question so, or your comment. Hi, I'm Barbara. I just wanted to say that Dolly Parton has this um, a thing that she does where you can sign up with her and she will send a child that you sign up a book every month. And it's free and I signed up my niece for that and I can't remember the name of the program, but it Dolly Parton reading program, you can find it. Anyway, that's another wonderful thing that she does. Dolly Parton, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for that, by the way. Hi, Ajahn Nisbo. Thank you so much for that Dharma talk. That was really, really good. Um, I have a question about, um, so I know in Tibetan, the Tibetan tradition, they have this thing called Tonglen meditation where you take in the suffering of others mm. and, and, and I guess put out compassion. Is there anything like that? I mean, it sounds a lot like what you were talking about, like to understand where people are coming from is to, to understand their suffering and to, I guess, come to terms with it and, and 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 then also, what is the role of forgiveness in our tradition? How does that play into it? Yeah, yeah. big questions there, Mike. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, self-forgiveness is uh, having respect for and understanding one's own conditionality. So acknowledging, you know, where we're coming from and where those conditions have led us and how could we be at this moment any, any other way. And the same really goes for forgiveness for others. Um, I think we all have that moment of not understanding why someone is the way they are and then we learn about something going on in their home life or their childhood and there's just this exhalation of like, uh, of course, of course. And that's tracing things back to the first noble truth is is seeing the initiating wound and comprehending it and um there's huge forgiveness and release there and also a settling of the heart um and this is the beauty of the buddhist teaching on conditionality is if you understand it there's uh when you really see things how to come together how they come together there's not that feeling of it being wrong so much of our mind chewing over something is not understanding how someone could be that way but if you understand, like everyone, we're all living in very different informational spaces and, and pasts, there's huge forgiveness hidden there. Um, and then you can also, you know, apart from just investigating those in conversation or in meditation, just one's own or other's conditionality, trying to trace it back to dukkha, to suffering. A and that takes a lot of restraint in a conversation. Can you not express your own opinion, but really try to find someone's Dharma language, like what's meaningful to them and what try to find their humanity and it, it it's kind of a fun game like can you can you find the common language you know um but then yeah then there's that's wisdom panya but then there's uh, samadhi and sila uh concentration or cultivation of mind states and ethics which are the other two aspects of the path so that's more in line with this active cultivation of loving kindness so you should have 10 minutes of loving kindness meditation every day um, it, it'll pervade out through your life. If you had to tell one person, someone to do one thing for 10 minutes every day, it would be loving kindness meditation. It, it changes the whole quality of a day. Um, 
And Tonglen practice is a skillful means of that. So that's a practice where you imagine breathing in the suffering of all beings as black smoke and transmuting it into light and exhaling out light to all of them in terms of goodness. Um, Long Por Anan, my teacher says that's good until you can actually do it. And then it can kind of stick with you. So a good way to metabolize that or imagine it is either you can imagine the white, uh, the, the black smoke moving through you and disappearing out the back so you don't keep it in you in terms of, you know, it's just perception, but it's meaningful. Um, or you can imagine the black smoke coming and colliding with your own defilement and kind of uh, s reacting into just bright light, you know, um, and then exhaling out the goodness and the light. So loving kindness practice, and that's one skillful means of that. Um, you know, and all those are useful, but I'd say that understanding of conditionality is, is the deepest. But then there's all these skillful means of, um, you know, another one around. So we've covered wisdom and samadhi, cultivation of mind states. But then there's just that one of ethics, sense restraint, stop watching so much news, you know, and, and don't, if people are just getting lost in that usual over dinner conversation about this or that, can you just, can you just be gentle and maybe not feed it as much, you know, so. Yeah. There's also a news site with just good news. I think it's called Karuna News. <laughs> and it's just like, there's articles on like, man adopts 30 puppies. And like, <laughs> it's really great. I had it bookmarked for a while. So yeah, that's worth a lot. Um, just while you were speaking, I feel like I was kind of noticing like, I was excited to start like seeing things more clearly than like people around me or something like that like there was like an ego starting to develop about like um being able to be the person that can kind of steer the conversation away and sort mm -hmm. of like this like um saviorism starting to develop and i want to avoid kind of i want to continue to that practice of like being more aware but avoid this ego developing um is, do you have comments on that? Oh, yeah, that's, yeah, big problem for monks, too. I mean, <laughs> it's like, um, I think uh, one really useful way uh, is to listen. You know, uh, like, monastics will often take on a, a thing called mukawat, which is where you, you, you can't speak for a time, and it just makes you be quiet and, and shut up <laughs> for a while. And, and there's really a place, like, so many of those conversations are, the root to someone's heart is just by listening to them and asking questions. And I mean, even around that, like everything we do in this path, a self will begin to form around. And just to, as long as you're meditating and aware of that, you'll you'll see it and just work with refining that. It's inevitable. Um, but I'd say one really skillful means is just listening and then holding those five conditions of admonishment very, very strictly. like. Because so often that self will kind of resurge whenever it's, even if it's a kind of gentle, ad, it's not admonishing, you're just telling them what they should do or what's right, you know. It, it still kind of has that quality. So like holding those five conditions of like, can you ask permission? Can you do it from a place of loving kindness and respect? But I'd say listening and, and aiming towards questions mainly is, is really helpful. But good question, yeah. Hi, I just want to share our conversations. What is the trick of the anger, right? Mm -hmm. And how you deal with that? Um, I think all of us, the trick, most of it is expectation. Hmm. Especially the one we love the most. <laughs> <laughs> They're married. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Especially when we love the most, we expect this person to be this way, to be that way. Why, why uh, he should do this, he shouldn't do that. Or he should say this, he shouldn't say that. So the expectation trickled the, 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 the anchor the most, especially people we care and we love the most because mm -hmm. we expect them to do that, that way. Mm -hmm. And I, after I listened to Ajahn Chah Salo, he said, we have to say the, the, the word that he should and should not, or she should and should not, this is irrelevant. Never use this one. Mm -hmm. Because we cannot change other people do this way, expect them to be this way and that way. For the people who doesn't care, who we don't care, it doesn't matter what they do. Even they do things that we didn't like very much, but we, we didn't upset about it. But we love the most act like that. So 
after that, I listened to Ajahn Chasalu say that I have to practice sati, use mindfulness. And when I start to feel like, oh, I can't expect him to be this way, that way, for live together for 30 years, he did do this way, so <laughs> may, not, may not expect that. It, it's work. And in my experience, this is how I deal with my anger. So this is just, just, just share the experience. So how I deal with my anger. But uh, to catch my feeling of anger, it shows in the body. Hmm. It tends. I have breath fast. So when I start to feel that way, let's say, like Ajahn said, you take time and cool down or go to talk to the dog. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean like that. So it's helped me a lot. So okay, okay, I, you do this, and then we just, I feel, I kind of feel that way. So I, we stop speech and action right away, and then it is all by itself. This is how I still deal with the problem, just use mindfulness. But it, it doesn't come by, by itself. You have to practice it, work hard for it. That's yeah. what I want to share. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Sadhu. And um, yeah, and we actually may have to stop questions about now. It's not too much time. But uh, yeah, uh, placing your awareness in your body and your, if you're about to power up, just power up right down into your feet, you know. And uh, the, uh, yeah, the expectations, Ajahn Jeff says, expectations are pre planned resentments. So it's a bumper sticker. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, and, and with spreading meta and not getting angry with people close to you, it is the hardest and often. And if you can just put a little distance between you and them, instead of thinking of them as your wife, husband, parent, child, can you think of them as a friend in birth, aging, and death with their own path and their own learning to have? And you might find that that small step back actually kind of rips some of the tentacles of self off. And there's actually room for like a breath of metta to come through. So. Also, your elbow is rarely angry. So if you need to put your awareness in your elbow, that's good. 